looks like we have uh, a number of folks online, a few still joining us, but I think we got lots to show you, so we'll get started. Um, we have a big crowd today. We usually do this uh, distinguished lecture in person. This is our first time on Zoom. I know many of you may be from outside Stanford, so I'll introduce myself, uh, Greg Deerline. I'm the faculty member here and director of the Bloom Earthquake Engineering Center. Um, really delighted to have today's lecture. I'm going to introduce our lecturer in, in just a couple of minutes, but before doing that, I wanted to say a few words about this uh, John Bloom Distinguished Lecture and about John Bloom himself. Um, John was a, a graduate of Stanford and also a, a benefactor in, in kind of creating the Bloom Center about uh, back in the mid 70s. Um, and what's shown on the screen right now is a quote that he gave to uh, a graduating class of Stanford students a few years ago, just reflecting on the, you know, the important role of uh, civil engineers and, and the important work we do. And I especially like the last part of this quote where he, he refers to the students that, you know, the main reward in our profession, and sometimes we do our job without public recognition when things, our structures and our uh, civil infrastructure works right. But the reward is just the self-satisfaction of creating and building things useful to others. And, and I think these were great words for John to the students and for our profession in general. Um, so in, uh, Oops, let me get my slide to advance there. So I did like to just take this occasion to reflect a little bit on, on John Bloom, the person, kind of his career as giving us a, a, a little bit of sense of history and, the, and the, the giants whose shoulders we stand on. Uh, John was a native Californian, actually born just a few years after the 1906 earthquake in San Francisco. Uh, so he grew up in the midst of the reconstruction after, in San Francisco and also seeing the devastating earthquakes, um, Santa Barbara earthquake 1925 and, and others. And so he came to Stanford as an undergraduate with a real kind of passion to get into engineering, structural engineering and earthquake engineering. And as shown on this slide, he did two degrees here. He did his bachelor's, his engineer degree, graduated in 1934. Um, what you see on the, the slide here is a picture of the uh, kind of an analog computer of the days uh, before digital computers were there but a model of the Alexander building that he studied structural dynamics. And in fact, while he was uh, a student here, he worked closely with a mechanical engineering professor, Lydic Jacobson, and they wrote a number of kind of landmark papers out of the research looking at structural dynamics and inelastic effects on structures. Um, the other point about John, you notice in, he, he went out into practice for about 30 years and then came back in 1967. And he was always interested in, in teaching himself new things and learning new things and staying current. And of course, in the intervening times between 34 and 67, digital computers came of age, the, the beginning of probabilistic seismic hazard analysis. A lot of the things that we take for granted today were really kind of started in that time. You see here a picture of the, uh, uh, the, the early uh, earthquake engineering center. This was one of the first shake tables uh, in the world looking at that, which was kind of put in by the faculty after the 1906 earthquake. And you see that model of the Alexander building there. And we've kind of continued this tradition to focus on, on um, earthquake engineering, structural dynamics. And I think more recently, we go beyond it, looking at kind of risk assessment and then getting into questions of resilience and sustainability. Um, John, over his career, when he graduated, about 10 years into his career, he formed his own firm, John Bloom and Associates. And I just show a couple of the landmark projects, very kind of interesting studies, looking at nuclear power, doing some pioneering work on, on seismic hazard analysis, um, looking at um, ground shaking and so forth, characterizing that. Some work at the uh, NASA Ames, the wind tunnel, some kind of these unusual projects that demanded kind of a higher level of, say, structural mechanics or bringing in uh, statistical methods, work on the Stanford Linear Accelerator, the Embarcadero Center. And, and John and his associates, and there's a long group of alumni who came through with his firm that are many of the leaders of their day, you know, and worked on kind of all of these landmark projects. Um, then in the mid 70s, John uh, gave back to Stanford in a big way by the creation of the uh, Bloom Earthquake Engineering Center. Um, shown in this picture here are the two co-founding directors of the center, Jim Gear on the left. There's a picture of John Bloom and Haresh Shah kind of formed that. And, and I think by kind of endowing this center, John was kind of giving back to research and education and also the links into professional practice have been an important part of what we've done and indeed what we're continuing. 
And so today's lecture is part of that continuation on, on the research education, looking to the future and ties into professional practice. So with that, I'd like to uh, introduce today's speaker. Um, Craig Switler is with us. He's the US board chair and managing principal of a firm, Burrow Happel. Um, Craig spent most of his career as a structural engineer by training, went to do his degrees at Johns Hopkins and MIT. I spent about 29 years with Burrow Happel and about 20 years ago, opened their first US office in, uh, in New York City and continued to grow and open up other offices. And as I mentioned, he's now uh, the board chair of it. Uh, Burrow Happel is a, quite an interesting firm. They do structural engineering, but they do much more broadly engineering of buildings, looking at things like uh, uh, ventilation, uh, lighting, uh, and also going beyond the building to look at kind of kind of urban issues. And I think Craig will speak to some of these and perhaps introduce the Burrow Happel better than I can do. Um, Craig also in his career, he's, he's uh, spent about seven years as a uh, associate professor of practice at Columbia University in the School of Architecture and Planning. Also prior to that, spent a number of years uh, in a similar position up at RPI. Um, so while Craig's uh, basic skills start in structural engineering, and indeed he has a number of landmark projects. Some of those were listed in the announcement, and I think we'll see some of them today. The, this incredible jewel facility at the Changi Airport in Singapore, London's Millennial Dome, um, Atlanta's Mercedes Stadium, and many other structures. But I think through his career, uh, Craig has looked kind of beyond structures into the broader issue of kind of buildings and urban development. And, and I think his, his topic for today, the futures in shaping our built environment is particularly apropos because certainly here at Stanford, uh, and I think many civil and environmental engineering programs are starting to adapt and look to the future and, and going you know, beyond our discipline, interfacing more with the urban habitat and other things. So with that, I'd like to uh, welcome Craig and uh, I'll turn the podium over to him. Um, just a word of thanks to, to Stanford and uh, for inviting me. I, uh, my only wish is that I was there in person because uh, this is a little weird. Well, again, thank you very much. Uh, um, I, uh, you know, in, in it, you know, this, this, this lecture is really just trying to summarize some of the things I've been thinking about recently. Um, it's been a very strange year. Um, but hopefully, you know, you, you get a little bit of insight into me, into our firm, uh, but also more, probably most importantly, into, into what is coming in the future and what opportunities might be there for you. Um, let's see, I'm trying to advance my slides here. So our firm, uh, um, Greg introduced us, we were founded in 1976. I joined around 1992, there are 25 offices worldwide. Um, uh, and uh, I uh, currently am the chair of our, of our US offices, although I work globally um, with a lot of my partners. We are a partnership um, around the world. Um, I, I count myself pretty lucky uh, in terms of the projects I've been able to work on to, with Bureau Happold, and this is just a sort of a range of them. Um, you know, we've done a lot of projects, uh, you know, both in the United States and around the world. And, um, and we've worked for some amazing clients and with amazing architects and city planners. Our firm has a, a very serious uh, um, take on sustainability. It's, it's something that's sort of built into our DNA. Um, and we've, we've made some commitments here to be both net zero carbon for our own business operations um, in this year, and uh, also for our projects that we are looking for um, uh, all of our new build projects will be net zero carbon in operation by 2030 and all projects by 2050. Um, these are pretty stretch goals considering we made them <laughs> prior to the pandemic, but we are, we are still really actively working you know, with, with our clients uh, on many of these and I'll show you some of them today. Um, Ted Happel was the founder of our practice. He, he passed away over 20 years ago. We're a multi-generational partnership at this point. Um, I was able to, to get to know him a little bit as a, as a younger engineer. His, his idea really resonated with me as a young engineer that, that engineering goes way beyond um, just you know, the, the drawings and the calculations. And uh, I always felt that that was really a part of uh, Bjor Happold. Um, what lured me to Bjor Happel as a structural engineer initially was the what I think of as the lure of lightness. 
Um, I love doing lightweight structures. I've done tensile structures in my career, grid shells. Uh, and this has a sort of a history at our practice, um, you know, from Ted Happel to Ian Liddell to Mike Cook, and I've worked with um, all of them. And, uh, and it's, it's really, been a, really been a pleasure um, to, to learn from so many people within our practice. I think the other issue for me that really dawned on me probably about 15 years ago in my career was that scale was incredibly important. Um, and to, you know, as a building engineer, we're often involved in the detail and the minutia um, of, of a building, of a, of a building project and construction project, even if it's a large construction project. But yet scale had so much other complexity to it. Um, and, and I think that's where, we, when we start to think about sustainability at a building level and sustainability, it's district and city scale becomes a much broader and wider problem. And, and I think there's a lot more opportunity. So I just wanted to th start by saying what keeps me up at night. These are the things that I worry about um, because, uh, you know, maybe just to share um, with you all, um, you know, what we do to the planet is incredibly um, important. And it's, it's uh, this is a quote from Tom Friedman, um, an author I like from the New York Times. And, um, you know, basically you just don't mess around with mother nature. And uh, it seems to me that we are messing around a lot with mother nature these days. Um, another uh, author I like, Paul Hawken, um, somewhere along the way, we just became very wasteful. Our systems um, were just produced a lot of waste and, and a lot of inefficiency. And this is just something that really grates me um, in terms of these thinking about these, these systems, because of course, it might be the cheapest way of doing something, but externalities seem to create um, a lot of, uh, you know, lower cost or some, some for, for, for various reasons. I mean, this is a sobering fact that within my lifetime that more people are living in cities than in rural conditions. Um, and this is broadly um, agreed that around 2008, 2009, the planet um, shifted. Uh, and this is not stopping. And in general, this is a good thing. Um, cities actually offer a, a higher quality of life generally, and, and, and actually better, um, better opportunities to potentially address sustainability along the way. But rapid urbanization is a monumental problem. Um, this, of course, manifests itself into global carbon footprints all over the world in various ways, and and uh, and and this becomes, you know, a, a, a significant issue, I think, for us as we see, um, you know, the effects of urbanization and the effects of industrialization. I I show this image because I think about it a lot. Um, that you know, all of this is compounded by the fact that we are we live in in many societies where uh, at the push of a button we can get what we want and you know, of course not everybody in the world lives like this but the air con air conditioning i think in general as a as a as a technology had such a profound impact you know on the way that we live in cities and where cities you know can are are developing um, so it it just seems to me that there is a real dark side of that type of instant gratification that we have to be very careful about. Of course, this has led to, um, you know, carbonization, carbonized, uh, the, you know, producing carbon and, uh, and, and clearly the spikes that we're seeing um, today, it's not spike, it just keeps going up. And what problems are a result of that? Um, I see direct linkages between these, between, you know, what I'm, it's not an earthquake, of course, um, but the aftershocks of, of this, you know, clearly being around political instabilities, um, disease, of course, as we're all, um, you know, within right now, infrastructure um, uh, really being pushed to the brink, rainfall, et cetera. And, you know, I think it's undoubtedly that there's a growing cost of what is happening in the world and the growing costs and, and, and how this is impacting us. I mean, you can only look to the recent, um, the recent headlines in Texas to say, to see that how much human suffering and, and also infrastructural, um, just infrastructure investment is lacking in certain ways, not, not necessarily just to, to, um, to develop infrastructure, but to protect it from what is coming. So can we face these challenges? 
Um, I told you what I was going to keep me up at night, but what 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 I face on on these challenges is, um, well, let me start here. Um, a couple of years ago, I uh, went to the Venice Biennale, and um, the Venice Biennale is a, a architectural biennale in uh, in Venice, of course, um, where a lot of architects get together and artists and and planners and urban designers from around the world. And you know, I was expecting something. That was, you know, essentially about, you know, quite, you know, you know, theoretical architecture and uh, and materials and things of that nature. And what was very interesting here is uh, the curator um, Alejandro Aravena, uh, who is a very influential architect, Pritzker Prize winner um, since that point, um, had this simple diagram really at the center of the Biennale, and I just really uh, it resonated with me. It resonated with me that architects and planners and designers are thinking about so many issues beyond just the, the physical nature of building cities, um, inequality, sustainability, pollution, um, migration, segregation. And I, I really, what also resonated with me is his X equals in the middle of this diagram. I just liked it. It, it, it spoke to me that not necessarily there's a closed form solution for anything here, but there are solutions, and uh, for me, for me, that very much resonated because so much of this is about design. This is what we are taught. This is what you are being, you know, taught right now. Design actually has so much impact and so much impact on the on the problems and the challenges that we face. And these systems, the smog, in 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 this photograph was designed by someone. So if we could design poorly, we can also design well. Um, so what strategies will drive these types of changes? What, what are the things that are on my mind thinking about going forward? So uh, I've separated these into five areas, called five futures, of course, because that's the lecture. Um, and uh, and, and they'll be, we'll go through them each individually. The first is a collaborative future. I, I think when I was in school, um, and and for most of the 20th century at least, you know, architecture, design, even you know, invention was seen as the purview of maybe one person, you know, often, you know, one one male certainly, and uh, and I think that has started that that is fractured, in a way, and and that is not the way that we see collaboration. Certainly not the way I've been. You know, we've developed it at Bjor Happel, but certainly not the way that we live life today. The other way that sort of crept in on collaboration was this sort of SWAT team. We had these um, uh, we had these teams around our practice that were floating around, so specialist teams for a while. Um, so you would have to call them in on your specific assignment or maybe your computational piece or your special structure. And at some point, we we also felt that that was the wrong way of doing it to have these sort of more specialized um, units, because, of course, what we were striving for in engineering and design was to have everyone able to have access to as many tools, as many complex tools as possible. So we we embarked about five years ago on a process. Um, what was, you know, we thought about then is mass participation and collaboration, but also computation. Um, every engineer at the practice should have specialized skill sets. We didn't want a team of 15 or 20 engineers being part of some advanced geometry unit. We wanted all of our engineers to be part of it. And interesting enough, the, 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 our teams responded in kind. And from a collaboration point of view, they developed this thing, which we still call today the computational collective. Um, on the left-hand side is a series of code and, and other elements going on. On the right-hand side are sort of engineers and, and offices and people contributing to it. And it, 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 I, I like this diagram because it sort of describes a sort of neural network approach to collaboration. Like, I mean, it is about as far away from the Howard Rourke and, and, and Anne Rand as you could possibly think of. And um, for me, I think this was a really a turning point for us as, as, as a firm. Because of course, you know, collaboration you know, when you're sitting there in a group is 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 you know it, it is still obviously very effective. But collaboration is so distributed today, and even and now clearly with with the advent of COVID and 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 working on screens and things of that nature, it's even more so. But sort of the way that we co-create is is different today. 
And I want to say what this looks like in, in terms of our code, our coding, and, and what we do in our practice is very important. We, we have something called um, the bomb. And I just want to show you this a little bit in terms of collaboration, because you know, for us, this is this is a very important way of that we develop projects, and I'll show you an example in just a second. But you know, we think of connecting everything to everyone uh, is imp incredibly important with respect to how you go about your projects. So how the bomb works is that we have links to our our software that we use. We have object models, and we have customizable engines. The the sort of real secret sauce in terms of how we're doing our work, and all of these things together kind of form toolkits that that our teams use around the world very much interactively. So, you know, the typical problem is that you have a whole series of pieces of software that software vendors want you to use and none of them really talk to each other. So you have to, you know, devise all these little APIs and, and get all the software to talk to each other. But we figured out a way of actually having all of the software talk to one single entity. This is what we call the bomb. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and this allows us to sort of, you know, grab a whole universe really of software and 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 use at our disposal and collaborate, you know, in a very um, in very much a distributed manner across the world. So, um, and and our you know the the success of this over the last five years has been great. Uh, you know, other other firms are doing this certainly too, but we've found that this is just sort of at the heart now of our integration, you know, within projects. So. A project, a project that we use this type of um, collaboration on, uh, and and really, I think these collaborations, you know, start to point to the fact that you, when you get to a very complex project, you're going to be faced with complex collaboration, and this was a complex project. Mercedes-Benz Stadium, it's in Atlanta, the Architects HOK, um, large-scale NFL and uh, MLS stadium. Um, it was unique in that we proposed a retractable roof that wasn't necessarily just sliding, but it actually opens in an iris configuration, and you'll see exactly what that means in a second. It starts with a sketch, Bill Johnson of, of, of HOK, was very influential in the early days, um, who, was, who was the architect leading the team alongside a whole architecture team and, uh, and, and client team. Um, but these are some of the early kind of idea sketches. And this gives you a sense um, of, the, of the sort of concept of the building, you know, very transparent open sides um, to the building, um, but the roof has this uh, ability to operate in, in, an, uh, in an opening way um, to, slide. So each of these panels, while they look like they're rotating, they're not really rotating, they're just simply sliding on tracks. And that also allowed us to put an extremely large um, scoreboard right in the middle, which we thought was pretty cool, called the halo. And, um, and this allowed us to, to really develop a stadium design that could accommodate soccer and football, but also a, a stadium that was adaptable to the needs of Atlanta, to the needs of the fans, um, to having an open air experience um, or closed air um, game and experience um, simul almost simultaneously. Although it's not quite simultaneously, the roof takes about 10 minutes to open. So um, this is the completed project is completed in 2017 at a Super Bowl in 2019. So you can get a sense of, of, of what the interior looks like. So let me show you a little bit behind the engineering of this. This is a cross section of the, of, of the um, stadium you can see the sort of halo in the middle you can see the stands in green the truss uh, structures are, are in blue uh, the roof trusses um, are complex they 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 look complex when when they're down i'll rationalize them a little bit to show you but this is what the roof structure was the the main spans are about 730 feet there are four principal trusses the the unique element of this is that we we develop these trusses um, really as a as a uh, lattice, um, fully moment connected um, to, to develop the internal uh, supports for the pedals. We then um, put uh, trusses that effectively acted as rails um, that would support the, the, the pedals and the opening panels. Um, these actually needed a secondary truss, what we call a C truss, which actually helped with the backspan of those panels, which will make sense in a second. And so all of that, all of that effectively comprises the fixed roof of the stadium. These are very, very big steel members. Um, some of the 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 um, 
uh, the splices, um, the largest uh, section sizes that we could get. Um, some of the splices were hundreds of bolts. Um, really amazing uh, job by the fabricators and the contractors um, in getting this together. You can see some of the scale of these elements and that actually is, is actually one of the smaller trusses on the project. But just to give a sense of the roof itself, this, this gives you another indication of how the roof works. One of the things that we were interested in the roof here was how do we move lesser amounts of material in terms of the weight shorter distances. We felt that larger scale oper operable roofs often, often did not work because they had such large um, pieces moving and we wanted to do something that was uh, what we thought was more innovative. The challenge of these, of course, is that the, the roof panels themselves are cantilevers. They're over 200 foot cantilevers with a 40 foot backspan. So that's exactly why we had to have those two parallel trusses. And 200 feet cantilever is no mean feat, particularly on something that's actually moving. Um, so so this, this took quite a bit of, uh, of time and you can sort of see the basic you know, diagram of this. You can see the person in scale on the, on the left-hand side. These are big, um, these pedals, um, they, they sound small, but they're not small, they're very big. Um, so, uh, and this gives you a, a bit of a sense of, the, of, of some of the, the structural heft in these. Um, moving them was, was complicated in that uh, we had uh, bogies that, that ride on the rails and these bogies um, have uh, move, move along with, um, uh, you know, with motors and uh, you can see the isometrics here and you can also see um, some of, the, some of the, um, the finished product. So you can see the panels moving here in schematic. So we had a SAP analysis model incredibly big, incredibly large and complex model, incredibly, this is, this is just an image of some of the loads that we had to map onto the structures, very complex as a structural engineer, um, you know, through all of the mechanisms here. And the 3D model ultimately being a deliverable for us, really there was almost no way to build this stadium in, 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 in typical 2D fashion with 2D drawings just wasn't possible. So we delivered, um, most of the deliverables were in Tecla um, in 3D so that the contractors could rely on these models. We were working directly in the models with the contractors, almost you know, the entire process. This just shows an example screen. I mean, some of the complex connections were so, um, were so difficult that you really, you just couldn't do them in 2D. And this is an example looking at a, um, a sort of a 3D shot and a 2D drawing, you know, there's just, there's just no way to effectively review those 2D drawings. Um, so you get to connection nodes of this na nature. You see the, see that that's a gusset plate, and you see the um, the uh, fabricators sitting there for context. You see some of these um, plates, so they're quite complex connections. So you see the finished product here. This is almost um, at completion. Um, this is at after completion with the with the roof open, and uh, and just. You know, again, to collaboration, this is a Navis Works model, actually, that shows all the systems of, of the entire project knitted together. Um, you know, our, our, our focus was on um, mostly on the structure and the facades, lighting and, and some other elements, but very complex interwoven parts throughout the entire stadium. Back to this bomb issue, we use this to basically rationalize all of the collaboration throughout our team. I just, you know, looking back on the process, I'm not quite sure how how it would have worked without all of the software at our disposal. Um, our team is our team. Our team is people. Teams are engineers, um, you know, working very hard all around the clock. Uh, at times, you're probably up to 30, 40 people on our team if you're happy to loan. Um, clearly, uh, a lot of teams on the contractor side as well. And and finally, and I'll get to this, you know, quite a you know a few times. It's just really important from the perspective of uh, the people that we serve um, in, in terms of the buildings that, that are here. So let me go on to climate positive future. So um, my second uh, um, future here is about climate. And of course, this is something that uh, we take very seriously. And you know, I, I do believe you know, climate change is, is an incredible obstacle and incredible threat you know, to you know, facing us in, in the next, you know, over the next decades and, and beyond. Um, carbon emissions by sector, this is just the sort of global carbon emissions. And it's quite interesting. 
um, when you look at it, 39%, 40% here from building operations and buildings, materials, and constructions. What that tells me is that engineers can have a really important impact uh, on design of, of operations and buildings and material and construction. In fact, in certain areas in dense in dense cities, you might actually, that might get up to 75% of carbon emissions. So we can have a real impact in terms of reduction and reduction Re reducing of, of carbon emissions, you know, as engineers. And that that's obviously, that should be obvious to everyone. Um, Cradle to Cradle, which is a very important book. If you haven't read it, you really should read it. It's a little dated now, but 2002 about William McDonough's uh, sort of, you know, really rethinking the way that we we, the way that the way that everything has been developed um, up to that point and and really almost inventing single-handedly you know the ideas around sustainability and this really dogmatic idea about reducing energy use now over time reducing energy use also has some issues associated with it but I don't want to get into that today generally speaking it's a good it's a good um, idea and you know we ask our all of our clients what if every single project began with a pathway to net zero carbon? This is what we do. Um, you see this diagram on the left-hand side is a baseline. It's where we typically start. You know, we typically move in design to lower EUIs or energy use intensity strategies. You know, then we we tackle the idea. Well, maybe we can actually start to balance this. And and you see the orange is our productions and offsets. Maybe we can have onset uh, offsite production or onsite production. And ultimately, we get to um, a sort of a balance. And when we hit that that um, that line, you know, we know we we're getting to net zero. Is this possible? It's absolutely possible. We've been doing it for you know quite a while now on buildings. Um, does we do it on every building? No, but I I I suspect we will be doing it on most buildings going forward. And this is just another example of that. You know, from from going you know from your average to your e you know to a maybe a low or high performance building, low energy. Um, we also like all electric systems these days because of course. With an electric system, any grid efficiencies that you're getting, as the grid gets cleaner, your buildings are getting cleaner simultaneously. An example, uh, there are many of them out there. Um, this, is a, this is a building that we designed, finished a couple of years ago, the Hitchcock Center in Amherst, Maine, uh, sorry, Amherst, Massachusetts. It was a living build, certified living building, but net, net positive energy, net positive water. And you can see we can operate these buildings. This this just shows a yearly um, sort of energy cycle for the building, uh, and it shows obviously we we are we need more energy in the in the winter months due to heating and other demands. But in the summer months, we're producing other uh, the the requisite energy to make it net positive. Um, what is encouraging to me is that clients, larger scale clients and larger scale planning, are now really approaching this discussion as well not on a single building or small building, starting to get clients that say, how can I make my entire development? How can I make my entire neighborhood net zero? Um, this is this is just an example from um, a project that we were doing in Sidewalk Labs since actually not gone ahead, but um, the, you know, just the, the sort of idea that we are scaling up is important. So a few projects to look at here quickly. Um, PNC Tower was a tower we completed uh, around 2016, I believe. Um, it's in Pittsburgh. Uh, it was an office tower for a bank and they had a very strong mission. They wanted to make a, a, a building that was not just low energy, but also spoke about health and wellness within their, um, to, to their staff. And they had a very strong sustainability um, uh, um, mantra at the at the company and very strong sustainability outlook um, the architects came to us and said look we want we want a building that breathes we don't want to totally hermetically seal this building like typical office buildings are done these days we we want to see how we can use air and airflow in this building you know more efficiently we want more fresh air in the building we want more uh, and we want energy reduction simultaneously so our concept that we came back with was for a porous building, a building that breathes, that, that can open its windows, but also a building that can actually extract its air up through its through what we eventually developed as a solar chimney. So this project, you can see at the top, the sort of 
pink um, element there actually is, is a, a, a series of glass panels that heats up during the day and actually sucks air and extracts air throughout the building. So, you know, typical office building to a certain extent in terms of, you know, the thousand people that are, or a couple of thousand people that are working there. Um, but little do they know that the building is actually operating um, essentially in a passive mode. And this gives you a sort of a sense of it. So this is just a cross section of the building um, where we can bring air in from the from the outside, and you see air coming in, you know, going up these extracts um, that are shafts, literally, you know, 700 foot shafts in the building. But that that element at the top being a solar collector, which draws the the air and forces it out. Um, so you get a little bit of sense here. Um, we had to come up with a facade system, of course, that was porous, so it could allow that air to come in the building. Um, the architects um, developed that alongside of our engineers. Um, the tower, uh, the, the, this, this just shows some of the CFD work on it. Um, you can see some of the, the, the you know, we, we just couldn't have done, we couldn't have predicted what we needed to predict without the CFD work that our teams were able to do here. Uh, and in the end, I think the, the, the one of the big takeaways was not only that we could ventilate a building and we could actually bring a lot more fresh air into the building. Um, the building does shut down in summer and, and winter modes when it's too humid or too hot outside. But for about six months a year in spring and fall, it's it's generally passively ventilated. Uh, and, and the energy reduction is measurable. The energy reduction is somewhere in the range of 50% of operational, which is significant. Um, and you know, to think about that, we can actually be building buildings that are significantly more less impactful in terms of energy use is important. So, moving on, uh, the the Cornell Tech Camp is another example. It's a different type of example of reduction of energy, but it's it's uh, it's an interesting one nonetheless. It's a this is a um, basically a, you know apartment house or dorm for the new Cornell Tech Campus in New York City. Um, but we use a strategy that's normally used in very small houses around passive house, which is essentially very high levels of insulation, good quality um, massing and orientation um, to, to essentially try and insulate and, and not really create particularly active systems per se, but to, um, you know, to, to, uh, to essentially keep the heat you know, to keep the heat and cold out and to keep the temperatures as controlled inside as possible. So that's just an example of difference between say passive and active. When it broke ground, it was the, it, it, it was, and it, it was when it was built, it was the tallest uh, and, and largest passive house building in the world. Um, this is it completed, this is on the right hand side, um, it's part of a larger tech campus um, for and in the middle of New York City. Um, this is just an example of the floor plan. Uh, we use VRF systems here, which were uh, useful um, in terms of the, you know, the their 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 end efficiency on the building, but not you could you could do passive house with a series of other systems, totally possible. Um, I think for us, I think what was very interesting here was the the reduction in energies of the building were significant, 35 percent or so in, in the predictive models, um, and and operationally now from the from the perspective of the residential, what was also really interesting to us on the bottom side, it's not that well indicated, but the red is the peak heating load reductions, which is very significant for um, a building. Continuing considering that you know heating loads. Um, are really, uh, you know, New York City in residential concerns is, is typically heating dominated. There's a solution here in terms of multi-use residential in dense urban uh, conditions. And we're, we're convinced that passive houses, um, you know, the, the upcharge in terms of the insulation, things like that are probably um, not that significant can, compared to where you can save on energy. So it's a really interesting strategy from our perspective. Oh. We're getting my next slide here. And finally, you know, just thinking about full building analysis, we, we, we did not do a carbon study or carbon-based analysis on this building, but we did this post um, with some of the tools that we've developed through the bomb. And, and really, you know, we, we, we're looking right now to put projects together where we can put that both embodied carbon and operational carbon ideas together. Um, because of course, this is what's happening out there. And it's really, pretty interesting. I mean, if you think that black bar is the operational carbon 
that is going down. Operational carbon is going down. There's no doubt about it. We're getting better at designing. Our, our grids are getting cleaner. When our grids finally get very clean, we are going to be down to you know lower levels of operational carbon. And then at that point, embodied carbon really becomes, you know, what you know, this what do we do with the embodied carbon element? Clearly, embodied carbon now is starting to become almost equally challenging in terms of carbon reductions as operational carbon. But that's a whole nother lecture that I could give on, on some of my thoughts there. Um, I'm happy to take some questions at the end. Fine. Um, next, repurpose future. So repurposing is really important to me. When I look at this, I look at New York City. I also look at a bunch of buildings that I know are going to be there for a long period of time. I mean, with our existing cities, we know we, know we have existing fabric and we're going to have to deal with it. New York City passed a Carbon Mobilization Act um, uh, only two years ago in 2019, um, which actually is going to require these buildings to be retrofitted. Um, so the market is moving, and that's a good thing. But you know, I, I go back to a project that I did um, back uh, in, in the mid-2000s, one of our early projects at Bureau Happold. It was the High Line in New York. And you know we were the we were the engineers on this, and we we went through the competition, and you know we this whole discussion about whether you're going to tear down the High Line or, or rebuild it in some fashion. And you know if, for those of you who don't know the High Line, it's an elevated rail that was in in uh, Lower Manhattan, um, actually in Chelsea. Um, it it became dilapidated, and in 1994, it kind of looked like this you know weird garden that had grown up, uh, and uh, you know it was just basically sitting there. You know, while everybody's going to their art galleries underneath and their restaurants, it was just sitting there. Today, it's successfully refurbished. We've added on to it several different times. It's still the engineers for the whole mile and a half long, you know, um, thing. And but it, it it spoke to me in a, in a really interesting way. And and it, it, the High Line became and it is one of the biggest tourist destinations in New York. Um, COVID notwithstanding, uh, you know, before COVID, it was it was second only to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. This is an unused railway viaduct. I mean, that to me, just there was something else going on here. It wasn't just that it was it it, it wasn't just the High Line itself, and it's it's something that we've seen across a number of other projects. Um, we are working in Detroit, um, Michigan Central Station. This is a picture of the Detroit train station um, uh, circa about probably 2018. Um, it had been unused for 30 to 40 years. It had fallen in, dilapidated in, in, in its, you know, in, you know, basically almost a carcass uh, of a building. And, and yet Ford um, Motor Company has now purchased the building. They're refurbishing it alongside, we're working on a series of teams and uh, you know, really bring new life back to an area of Detroit. To me, this is so important because these are these are assets. Why not see them as assets? Why not see these things not as eyesores, um, but as as elements of our cities that 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 really have true value? Um, you know, revitalizing, revaluing these elements of our city are just so critical, uh, and there's just so much there. Um, you know, everywhere, virtually everywhere you look in the, in the cities that we're working with, there are opportunities. Um, whether it's at the building scale, and these are, you know, you might recognize Battersea Power Station there from your um, Pink Floyd album covers. That's a, a old power station in in uh, in London that's been refurbished. It will now be the new Apple. Uh, um, it, it will be the headquarters for um, Apple in uh, in England going forward. Um, or you know, old buildings like the one on the left hand uh, corner, which is the book tower, which was abandoned for close to 40 years in downtown Detroit. And even the one in the middle, which is the Empire State Building, which is you know a, a project that we've been looking at in terms of deep energy retrofits for that type of building in New York City. And infrastructure. So as we start to think of stranded assets, we start to even think of broader infrastructure. And remember my scales from a while ago, this is what I've been thinking about. So, um, just quickly, this is a this is a project that we um, started to do about three years ago uh, on the Erie Canal. This is uh, working with the New York Power Authority, who we work with on a number of different um, strategic and consulting um, projects. We looked at how 
should New York State be using the Erie Canal? This is 525 miles. So we're, we're way beyond the, the high line of a mile and a half here. We're into you know, hundreds of miles of basically infrastructure that is, is essentially underutilized. And you can see this, this sort of graph shows you what's happened. I mean, basically there is virtually no industrial activity along the canal. It's only a, you know, a few boats a year. And the canal infrastructure really was up for being modernized and being reused in a certain way. But I mean, we're talking about hundreds of, of dams, hundreds of buildings. It, 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 is, a, it is a monumental project um, and, and one that we are starting to tackle right now. Um, this is the extent of the, 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 the barge canal system that it's essentially at its peak. Again, through what is essentially a pretty depressed area of, of New York State as well, through a very rural condition to a certain extent. And, um, and, and that, that shouldn't go unnoticed. And this Reimagine the Canals project is looking at areas of resilience, regeneration, restoration, um, and reuse. So it's, it's looking beyond just simply the economic development side of it, maybe in real estate terms, but it's also looking about resilience. Um, tremendous flooding in upstate New York uh, as, you know, alongside of you know, the effects of climate change um, that we're seeing in many other parts of the, of the country right now. Um, but we believe that the canal infrastructure can be retrofitted to help some of this. Um, and this is an example of Rome, New York. Um, property prices are pretty, um, you know, pretty, pretty low in, in this area of, of New York State. Um, but with some flood mitigation, we believe that we can actually bring property values up in, in Rome and, and we can really um, you know, add to the economic regeneration of that area. So these things are tied together in a very large way on this project. Another uh, area of resiliency improvement is irrigation for, for local farming. So thinking about how to use the, the canal, you know, not less as a transport waterway, but as an irrigation source to increase the value of the crops in Western New York. Uh, and finally also to thinking about the canal infrastructure is not just you know, dams and bridges and, 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 and locks and things of that nature, but as a, a fabric of upstate New York, a fabric of history that really can be um, celebrated um, and, and really used to activate local economy. So this has been an exciting project. We're doing uh, both engineering, economic analysis, strategy, planning, a you know, whole range of services um, for New York Power Authority. So how am I doing on time? Not too good. Um, I, got, I, got, um, I, I, got, I got to speed through my last two. Um, I got a healthy future here. So on my, on my next one, I wanna talk a little bit about health. So sick building syndrome is, um, is you know, established in the 1980s you know, with us today, uh, a lot you know, attributed you know, principally to indoor air quality and, the, and, and really poor indoor air quality in many buildings um, in our cities, even many you know, expensive buildings. Um, so it, it, is, it is a big issue. And I think there is a link, um, a, an emerging link between buildings and, and health that we are seeing more and more um, today. Um, environments, this is just some stats here. Environments are said to contribute it, it to 10% of the burden of disease um, within the United States. And you might say, well, that's not that much. But actually, in terms of if you look at the both the 10% of that and the 10% of improvement and the 10% on top of that, you see even the very smallest slice of improvement here could be billions and billions of dollars of, of uh, income. So it is a big deal in terms of, of, of what we are seeing in terms of that linkage from health to buildings. And COVID-19 has just simply accelerated that. COVID will be over one day. We will have better filtration certainly in our buildings, but it will be, in a, it will come back in some way, shape and form. There's no doubt that SARS or MERS or COVID will come back at some point in, in the future and we'll have to be ready for that. So, you know, we need to be respectful of this, but how does it, you know, what does it say to us? What does it say to us about engineers as building buildings? This is a project I did 20 years ago Genzyme headquarters is one of the first large scale platinum building, platinum lead buildings in the United States. And it was a great building. We did the environmental and structural projects with the German architect, Stefan Banish, great, great, amazing architect. Um, 
had this big atrium and had had lots of cool like systems but actually in the end this was actually what really i took from the project the the where where what was really being thought about um this is what we we sometimes call the iceberg model on the on the right hand side you see sort of the capital costs of the building and the energy and cleaning the land things of that nature the costs of the building but really the costs of a building must include the salaries and the staff related costs of the people that live in them or work in them and when you include the costs of say paying all of the people that were actually working in the genzyme project you see that over a period of time say a 20 year period of time the staff related costs can be up to 85 percent of your expense so in other words you, you you really need to think about where you're putting your money in terms of building buildings because obviously the first cost is is can be important for loans and things of that nature but the staff related costs are very big and through this building process, this called green building process at the time, although we, I think we've moved on from that, you know, we saw a lot of productivity gains. We saw a lot of improved product, um, and improved health and, 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 and correlations, you know, that, that Genzyme did in terms of measurements. And it, it strikes me is that we view buildings sort of in the wrong way. Um, you know, you know, often we view buildings, you know, with a, in a construction process or in even in a development process, from, you know, what's lighting and heating and acoustics and, and facades and structures and things of this nature, where we probably, you know, we need to see this in a much more broader fashion in terms of utilization, and retention and productivity and health. So this, this really has evolved for us as Bureau Happold into something that we would call just human centered design. Um, where we're actually looking at the end of outcomes of, of how people operate in buildings. Um, of course, we're not the only ones doing this. Um, the market has moved in this direction. You know, uh, basically USGBC originally really mandated looking at energy, you know, now starting to be connected to well, and even fit well in terms of thinking about health and healthy environments in buildings, which is good because of course, when we actually talk to owners, we're actually talking to them about these types of things now. Views and biophilia, look and feel, interior layouts, amenities, lighting and daylighting. These are the things that really are engaging um, in, in, in terms of the design process. Now, the pounds of steel and the, and the amount of CFMs of the air are very important too, um, you know, because they, they often drive the cost, but these are the areas that we're looking at. And, it's no doubt that we have a lot of data now that is actually feeding this idea. That's one of the, the great things about the well system is that it's really fed and, and developed a lot of data um, you know, on the back of this. And there are very serious impacts for, for the, and correlated impacts in terms of the health of, of occupants of buildings and the, and the downstream you know, health of the, the, the toxicity of materials and downstream health. And this just shows you, you know, since World War, Two, you know, we've actually, you know, modern additives, um, you know, there are a lot of nasty, you know, a lot of nasty materials in many of our building materials uh, that, that we breathe, we touch every day in buildings. And it's, it's increasingly dawning on, on designers that we need to mitigate this. Um, and when I talk about uh, health, we start to get into pretty complex stuff because of course, this is not as easy as making a roof, say, with less pounds a square foot of steel. Um, we we need um, something to think about that's actually tying all of these elements together, these qualitative, quantitative um, outcomes together. Again, going back to our bomb model, we start to use tools that can, do, do, you know, draw and 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 bring all of these things together. Um, let me give you a couple of examples projects. The first one is a project that we completed uh, uh, three or four years ago in Abu Dhabi. It's the Louvre Museum. Uh, really interesting project with an a, a enormous roof um, that covers a series of outdoor um, spaces which connect a series of museum pavilions. Now, out, you say outdoor and you say Abu Dhabi and, and the Middle East and eyebrows might raise, like how could you possibly do that? But it was a key element to the project to create not just a roof, but a shading element that could create a sort of a, a micro environment underneath the roof. 
So this is what the roof looks like. You can see that it's a large roof structure. You have the sense of the scale of the person. You can send, see the, all of the shading elements that were put into the roof. Mind you, the roof is not waterproof um, because rain is not a problem there per se. It's really just about blocking, um, it's about blocking the sun and creating that microclimate. Also the ability to bring water and, the, and literally the sea in under the roof was really important for this. And I show you this project in part because I think this image was an early image of the project, spoke to us as engineers, like <clears throat> that's a really tricky environment to design. Like how do you, but it, it's speaking about, you know, sitting under a tree or being in a more natural environment, being in a healthier environment. And typically people are in the Middle East because of course, you know, most of the time you're in an air conditioned environment in, in, in the Middle East. And, uh, and it, was, it was a real challenge and these challenges, but these challenges can be overcome. This is a thermal modeling uh, and environmental model. Actually, sorry, this was light modeling, you know, light testing to see how that would work. Um, series of environmental models and, uh, and CFD modeling to look at, at how cool we could really make the spaces inside. Um, this is an example of some of the materials used in a, a big, you know, uh, show the site and engineers on site. This is the final project. Um, this is the roof that was constructed in the buildings um, in, uh, that it, it spans over and the water that sort of tucks in underneath and an example of, of an environment I think that you can create. Well, whether or not it speaks about health, to me, it speaks about a very complex environment that we are able to design and deliver on. And I think that is what we need to be thinking about in terms of healthy buildings. Um, another, maybe, you know, shall we say more modest project, this is at Washington, this is a uni Washington University in St. Louis. Um, you know, a reason, but it, this is a, 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 a social, um, Brown School social work, um, about a you know, $40 million project. Nice project though. Um, and, uh, you know, it had a series of health and well being strategies. You know, pretty, you know, not, not maybe ground earth shaking, but complex enough that you really needed to do your work and your homework to make sure that these were integrated into the systems, into the, into the facade selections, into the, into the spaces, um, et cetera. And one of the things that the school wanted to do was measure. They wanted to measure this sort of healthy building approach. They did this thing called um, the BEEP and, uh, and we got some really interesting output from it. 24% increased physical activity, 48% increase in social connections. This is of course, from the older building that they were in, uh, et cetera. And, and I think, you know, what this shows in terms of conclusions is that, you know, you know driving health into, into is, good, is, is good architectural practice, it's good engineering practice, but it also takes a series of complex um, uh, solutions often that are multidisciplinary. So finally, I'm on to public future, almost getting there. Um, so I'm sort of wrapping up with futures in terms of being public here. Uh, I think, um, you know, from my perspective, place and people and process are all sort of connected in my, in my head. Um, but we started thinking about people in, in a different way about, you know, maybe about a decade, decade and a half ago when we started doing a lot of people flow modeling around egress and, um, and fire codes. This model on the right is a, a model that we did for building actually in New York City for the farm, for, for, for um, building department to measure the timed egress of exiting of people. And it's an interesting, you know, it, it, it's very interesting. I mean, these are, these are established models now for stadium evacuation, things of that nature. And so, you know, it, it's, you know, agent-based modeling is, is pretty established. Um, what we thought was interesting is how can we start to m use these agent-based models to actually inform how people use space or how we could potentially design space. And this is just an example of a floor plate that shows you if you can start to map how people actually are, are um, interacting, you can start to get insights into that. So this is just, these are agent-based models. We can you know code the agents in various ways and we can get a sense of how to maybe optimize designs. We can also, and this is I think in terms of you know, the public realm, we can also start to think about people's reactions in terms of the buildings that they're in. This is a, a series of studies we've done on atmosphere for sports stadiums um, throughout the UK. 
and it, it to to look at the way that fans react to the different types of stadium and stadium and seating configurations and looking at that human response. And I talk about these things because it starts to get really complicated. Um, of course, we've got our sort of bomb and our toolkit in the background that we we can start to think about how some of these things uh, interact, you know, in terms of, you know, whether it's, um, you know, these are you know, venue flexibility or uh, uh, um, fan perception and things of that nature. So we, we are thinking about this from sort of an analytical perspective. But I think generally speaking, where we want to go is we want to do better in the public realm. Um, you know, we, we want, we, we think the public realm can deliver more. Um, public spaces need to be designed and they need to be even increased. Remember the urbanization problem that I flagged a long time ago. Um, that is a big deal. Uh, and, and it is up to us to make urban, uh, urbanized living as effective as possible and as happy as possible for many people. So my final project I'll show is Jewel. Um, this is a project that I was, uh, I, you know, I've been involved in for a number of years is completed about a year, year and a half ago. It's in, um, uh, it's in um, Singapore. It was conceived of um, by the airport to, de to develop a large scale public facility that had a combination of retail and traveler amenity at the airport. Changi is one of the biggest airports in the world. It's an incredibly forward thinking airport. Um, we won the competition along with Moshe Safdie, and this was our concept for the building. You see all the air terminals that surround it. Um, and, and the concept was to have a, a, a basically one of the largest indoor gardens in the world with a waterfall in the middle of it. Um, yes, a little crazy, but uh, at the time, you know, the, the concept was to really drive, um, you know, what do travelers want? What, do, what does the local population want? What will be a sort of a symbol of, of, of Singapore? And, uh, and so really Capital Land and um, Changi Airport were really dedicated to this vision. Also this idea that we had to really be very, very sensitive because of this balance between people and garden. We had to be very sensitive to the environment. How do you create one of these environments? This just doesn't happen. It's not just you put a bunch of air handling units, you pump some air in there and you're, you're okay. We need to think very carefully about this. I tell you 10, in fact, we're the, the sustainability engineers on this, Mott McDonald with the MEP engineers, but we, we, were devel we developed the facade and the, and the structural um, configurations. And you can see for a single layer grid shell, I'm gonna shift into structural engineering mode for a little bit here. You'll see that, you know, these are pretty large spans, um, very large spans, in fact, and very low profiles. Um, there's not a lot of curvature on this, although it looks pretty curvy from the outside. And these are just from some scale elements, Pantheon uh, on the top. And most of you know, um, the Palazzo do Sport, a nice nervy project there, 61 meters and our jewel Changi down at the bottom. So we were dealing with something that was quite big. Um, the architects sort of were obsessed with the idea of a torus. Um, you know, I, uh, I, you know, it's not a torus. It's, uh, it's, it's the the whole is asymmetrical. There's all kinds of geometrical complexity around this thing. I don't want to get into, but it was complicated. Um, the diagramming of ideas, which is such an important part of the start of a project. You know, we were thinking about this thing in terms of its areas. It's internal, um, it's external, like the external being more compressive, the internal being more tension um, and how these things met. They, they end up meeting in this dark blue zone in, uh, in what would be considered a compression ring or almost like a, a bicycle uh, ring to a certain extent where the, the inner ring is sort of, is, is, drag, is, is all in tension hanging down and, and you see these sort of shell fields that um, you're getting these sort of stresses on. We've done, uh, as a company, we've done a lot of grid shells in the world. So we had a lot of confidence in terms of our approach to this, but it was a uh, little hairy nonetheless. Um, sorry, going back here. Um, this just shows, you know, some of the areas of, of you see the, the, the high reds or the compressions around that sort of um, top level compression zone. And, uh, you know, I just like these diagrams because you can sort of see force flowing within the structure. You see the bending moments um, that are happening over the um, support structures. Um, uh, for those of you who know shells, you'll know that you should not have a lot of bending in shells. Um, you know, shells do not like bending. So we had to have some very robust sections there 
to to both um, deal with the bending moments and the and and the in-plane shell forces you know that were developed for the system. Um, this this diagram I particularly like because it's fields of sort of axial force that are flowing all throughout the the, the building. Um, these are the types of things that we geek out on and uh, and 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 we look at and we look at very carefully to make sure that we're doing the right things in our designs. Um, show some of the element sizing. So this is a single layer system. It's not a trusses or anything like that. It's a single layer space frame, although, sorry, single layer grid shell. Although some of the sections get quite deep, um, they go up to about two feet deep. Um, most of the sections are around 10 inches. And this is what we delivered to the contractors um, for tender. This is part of our, our um, you know, as I said, you know, within our, our modeling these days, you know, it's, it's quite difficult to sort of do drawings on this stuff. So um, this, is, this is what we had given them. Um, we pretty were pretty confident that it could be built, but um, we were a little, we were still a little questioning at that point. <laughs> um, but we did a lot of work to to prove it, prove it was right. And this shows some of the cladding panels, some of the componentry, and one of the most complex things about this project is that we don't have a lot of repetition on the triangular panels. Now we have a pretty simple system here of node and beam, but we have a lot of complexity on the fabrication. There's not a lot of repetition. So we, we talked long time to the fabricators about this and they believed and was eventually proven right that really that wasn't a big deal um, because everything was being computer manufactured in any event. So the glass, the, the steel, the nodes could all be really you know, fabricated as, as to, to, to the specifications that we were we were getting at, although we had to look carefully at loads to see, you know, how 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 wide and 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 spacings and uh, and and angles and things of that nature to make sure everything could be fabricated. But as you see, you have a, this is actually the different types of glass units. So there's not a lot of repetition in this project, um, which I think, you know, at first we were concerned about, and then you know, ultimately the fabricators you know, bore out that, uh, you know, really the repetition wasn't necessary as long as we had, they had the, the, um, the proper computer files, showed some of the nodes here. Um, and there's a, let me just reach through some of the construction images. This just shows you a little bit of the construction um, as the shell is, uh, as the false work goes up, it's done sort of one slice at a time, goes up, you see some of the panels being, the glass panels being laid in here. And, uh, so, so uh, some of the final images. Um, this was really fun to see it um, when it was depropped um, on the construction site. Really, really interesting. The uh, Obayashi um, and Wohup were the uh, contractors, and they were unbelievable. The fabrication quality is like I've never seen before. Um, so just kudos to the, the technical acumen of those fabricators, contractors, and installers. Really amazing. Um, this is the finished product, and this is what it looks like inside. As you can see from some of my background, um, it has a train that moves back and forth, which is kind of cool. And uh, you know, it's 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 a, just an amazing planted garden, and um, get a sort of sense uh, with this amazing you know waterfall, forty meter waterfall, um, and it's very porous. Public, you can walk in, walk out. There's no charge. Um, you can land your plane. If you have a, an hour layover, you can go there. You can check into a hotel if you want. You can, if you live in Singapore, you can go for the day and do some shopping um, or eat in a restaurant or just meet some friends. And it is wildly popular. I think uh, over half a million people visited in the first weekend. And you know, it has just been this just incredible public space. And you know, for me, I think that is the sort of takeaway from it that you know all of the things we do and all of the engineering that we do ultimately can lead to something like this you know it 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 makes it all worth it but it also points to the future direction so in conclusion sorry if i've gone long here but you know collaborative future climate positive future repurposed healthy public all of these things hopefully i've created a few stories for you to think about um, I see a lot of questions here, so I'm not sure, sure we're going to get to all of them. But I wanted to say, why am I feeling optimistic as I'm sitting here in the middle of a pandemic, not being able to talk to you in in uh, in 
you know, face to face. But the reality is I am incredibly optimistic. You know, I'm an engineer, you know, I was taught to design, I was taught to optimize, I was taught to innovate and solve, but you know, the, and boy, there are challenges around us. I mean, just, just, you know, just getting out of COVID is gonna be a challenge in, in so many ways for our industry. But, you know, I think one of the things I've taken to, to heart along the way is that it's really not about the beams, the ducts. It's not about, it's, you know, these are elements that we are taught to design, but it's not about those or even carbon or energy or even broader systems. You know, it, it's, it's about how people ultimately feel in the buildings, how, how they respond. Because I think ultimately what I've come to the conclusion in my career, and I still have a few years ahead of me, um, is that, you know, it's really about serving people. You're not designing a beam in a building per se, you're designing maybe a floor system that could, you know, potentially allow researchers to, you know, you know, cure a, cure a disease one day. And, and I think that to me is, is really important to, to, to continue to remember for our teams. I, I say it to my teams all the time. Um, you know, so I would just say for you all, you know, please be optimistic, go out there, um, you know, change the world, you know, a beam or duct, a PV array at a time, um, you know, networks, um, buildings, plans, whatever it is, because, you know, I, I, I think about this all the time that, you know, really the most important stakeholder is all of us, you know, we're sitting in the room. All right, thank you. Okay. well. Thank you, Craig. That was really incredible. <laughs> I'm glad we recorded it because I think I'm going to have to watch this about five times to fully digest your five lessons and all the incredible projects that you showed. Um, we do have a lot of questions that came in. I'm going to, um, I'm thinking about those radio hosts who somehow are able to uh, manage the question. So I'll, we'll try to do it. We have just under 15 minutes because we do have to wrap up at one okay. o'clock just before because there are classes that, that kind of follow this. But uh, and so apologies to folks who put in questions. We probably won't get to them all. And some of them I might paraphrase a little bit because there's a few kind of common themes here. Um, but let me kind of start with a, an easier question. This comes from actually one of our students, Sijin Wang, who's uh, taking a class in AEC, architecture, engineering, mm -hmm. construction kind of collaboration. And, and Renata Fructu, who runs the class, teaches it. Um, gives the students a challenge. And one of the challenges for this year is on parametric adaptability by the Burrow Happel Tech Challenge. Mm -hmm. And so, so Sijin has a question, like what can a structural engineer do to use a parametric design if it's not a, a large or complicated structure? And also how do they engage their architecture and construction counterparts in that? That's a good question. Um, it's a really good question. I, you know, I, I, you know, being a structural engineer, I, I, I think you can see structural engineering in sort of two ways. One, you can, you can see it is that we design the beams and, you know, maybe we're not as relevant these days. You can also see it that structural engineers help architects and other and contractors and clients understand space and how to create space effectively and efficiently. Um, and that I think is a much more promising way of thinking about it. Um, because if you think about it from that perspective, you know, maybe your parametrics are looking at mass or looking at weight, because of course, weight is correlated often to cost, but maybe there are other parametrics that you need to be thinking about space or volume. Maybe the building needs to be oriented in such a way that wind flow um, is, is captured in the building so it can be passively ventilated. I mean, there, there. I mean, maybe your, uh, maybe a wall needs to be opened up, so you can't put bracing in that wall, you know, because you need light, you know, because of the exposure of of that building. I mean, there are so many things that you could put parametrically into a model that that will start to make a box, not just a box. And I would encourage you to think about that from a structural engineer's perspective, because if you think about structural engineering, really just about the materials themselves, I think you're missing the broader impact that structural engineering can have. Yeah, and I, and I think you showed examples. There's no such thing as a small, uncomplicated project, right? You could make something no. out of anything. No. So, there were a couple other questions, and I'll, I'll paraphrase these, but the common theme, and, and it's related to how to incentivize 
kind of owners to, to work with our profession design construction on issues of climate change, sustainability and net zero. I think recognizing there's, a, for, there's an upfront cost of that. And, you know, and for least bid or lowest bid solutions and also thinking even yourself, competitors in your field, other design firms who might mm -hmm. come in and do a project more simply mm -hmm. for a lower first cost. So mm -hmm. how do you get around that? And also importantly, what could our profession itself do to really, you know, as a profession to kind of help educate or push that forward to incentivize, mm -hmm. you know, better buildings in, in all the dimensions you described? Well, um, I mean, a few angles to that. Number one, it's it's pretty tough to, to to move a client to a place that they don't want to go, and that's probably a recipe for not a good thing. So, what you can do is you can encourage them that you know to think early in projects and maybe explore, but you're going to have to come up with the goods to 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 prove it to them. That Cornell Passive House project I showed you, in concept, you know the basically the the developer said could we do this and uh and we said you probably could although we've never seen it done before so we didn't say no we said maybe um and i think you can do that as a profession you can you you know it it, it didn't take us that long to con concept it out and you know lo and behold you know cornell actually really liked it and cornell was willing to pay the upcharge from the standard product to what it was going to be because they felt it was a really signature piece of their campus and and so yeah i think i think you can be there you, you do not want to be the engineer that says no you want to be the engineer that says maybe um i you know i would say from that perspective i you know i'd also say that one element for, is very important to me, and it's beyond the reach of engineers in in many circumstances. Is is regulation? Is 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 um, you know codification? I mean, the Climate Mobilization Act in New York State and New York City is going to do an incredible um, amount of work to pushing clients towards really thinking about carbon and and how they they look at carbon in their projects. You know why? Because in 2024 they start getting fined. Mm -hmm. And and those fines are not small. Um, so, you know, it, 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 I'm saying that it's kind of a combination of that. I mean, I think there's there's a market driven need for it, but I think regulatory pressures, you know, are really important. And frankly, we work with, with we actually helped New York City develop a carbon plan for itself and actually recommended some of the regulatory measures to, to, to put into that plan. Mm hmm. Yeah, so so a combination of kind of rising to the occasion, but also looking for regulation exactly coming forward. And uh, um, let's see, there were a couple of questions dealing with kind of the net zero. Uh, and the question was in in the face of kind of climate change, if the temperature uh, climate is say getting warmer, mm -hmm. will some of the solutions that work, you know, bringing in night cooling, mm -hmm. will there be loss in efficiency over time? Is that a big factor? And then also just projects uh, around the world that are in where there's large temperature fluctuations. I think here in the Bay Area, we're kind of blessed with a nice climate, you, though you showed the case yeah. in Pittsburgh that has a broader climate, but there's even other places that have larger swings. So, mm. so, so again, the question is, is climate change changing the calculations you would do on a project and, and ideas yeah. for really the, the I mean climate change making it harder there's no doubt about it it's making it warmer it's making it more variable um that's going to be with us and it's going to get worse so I yeah it, it, it's true I mean from that perspective yeah on that on that but that's not necessarily stopping us from the concept that we can do net you know net zero water net zero net, net positive water net positive um uh energy buildings uh you know, we we just finished a project. Um, you can all go Google it. Uh, Santa Monica City Services Building is one of the, you know, it, it's an administrative building for government workers in Santa Monica. It's net zero. Um, it's net it's net positive water as well. Net zero energy, and um, it's great. You know, and we use a, a number of different technologies in it. Um, but you know, it, it was just a motivated client. Um, at the same time, I tell you, Google and 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 other firms are certainly in Apple are certainly thinking about. The ramifications for their portfolio on on what some of these elements would be and climate change will make it harder there's no doubt about it but you know we got to get there so i what i'm shocked about is how quickly we are getting there think about it from this perspective you know 
if you make your building all electric, and when I say all electric, don't put fuel sources in like gas or, or, or diesel fuel or something like that in your building, make it all electric. So let's say you make it all electric today and maybe the grid and, and, and you get your energy results down quite a bit. I mean, in, in 20 years time, if the grid is cleaner, well, your building's cleaner. You know, all of a sudden, you know, we've got, we've got a, p- a potential when, as the grid shifts, like the problem gets incre- much easier. So the grid, I mean, there's a challenge on climate, but I tell you, if the grid keeps up and, and outpaces it in terms of its efficiencies and its cleanliness, we'll get to, we'll get to net zero quicker than we, we imagine, I believe. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, and uh, <laughs> maybe not, maybe not in Texas, but uh, yeah, I was going to say, t- yeah, it, it, Texas is a, <laughs> a is a good case about. Well, of course, in in a lot of engineering, we learn from not mistakes but circumstances. Certainly, earthquake engineering, we we learn from what happens, yep. what goes right, and what doesn't go right. Yeah. Um, yep. another question. I'm going to read this one to make sure I get it right from Chris Ford. He says, "Does engineering practice have a history of?" setting problem boundaries at a scale smaller than required for adequately engaging contemporary problems of the built environment. And, and what's the most significant feature of borough Happel that enables the larger bracketing of problems as you showed and shared today? I don't know if the bomb is so, the answer so, to that. <laughs> uh, well, okay, so, so you're basically saying that often engineers set the parameters, shall we say, they make the problem easier for themselves. Is that, yeah, is, that, is that the sort of premise? Well, it's probably the case. I mean, you know, I, I, you know, that's the sort of engineer that says no. You know, that's the engineer that says absolutely not. You know, I don't want to do it that way. Or, you know, you know, what about, what about a transparent roof with a waterfall? You know, one of the largest shells in, in the world, but you have to grow plants under it. So it has to be transparent. You know, no, I can't design that. Absolutely not. No, I mean, you have to say maybe. Um, so I think I think setting I you know we're maybe a company that that prides ourselves in setting those parameters wide, you know. But let's let's be honest. We're engineers. We're consultants and designers and economists. We're pretty practical at the end of the day. We're not going to set parameters that are so wide open that we can't achieve them. Um, you know, in the end, our buildings get built, um, and I think part of the the goal here is to widen it to the point where. You, you can do something, but you know, we're not experimental either. This is not the first, the thing behind me is not the first grid shell we've ever constructed in the world. Mm-hmm. I would have never done that project without the type of experience that our practice could have given to it, you know, at the time. So I think, I think it's, it's, yeah, I, I think you're right to say that you, if you're an engineer and you're continually shutting yourself down by making your problems easy to solve, that's a problem. Um, yeah, make make that make that problem just just big enough, maybe a little hairy enough, so you know you can solve it. Um, but you need a lot of help. But if I could just follow it up a little bit, because my sense is working with architects, they're the ones that expand our our vision, right, on a project. But. Uh, but sometimes you see the, I mean, okay. I, you know, I sometimes I mean it, it, it's true. Um, <laughs> the thing behind me. I, I will have to put my hand up. When when we first when we finally won the competition, I said to Moshe Safti, I said, you know, maybe we should think about a support in the middle. And he's like, Are you kidding me? You got get the hell out of my <laughs> No, he didn't say that. But I mean, he, he you know, I, I mean, yeah, we were concerned at, at first, you know, will, will this thing work? Will this, you know, we had done some concept studies on it, but we had to, a lot of work to do on it. Um I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think it can, I mean, you know, I think that sort of, yeah, the stereotype is the architect's creative, the engineer's practical and all that stuff. But, you know, my sense is that those things are mixing up. I mean, we were doing a, a we were doing a um, competition the other day on a tall building, uh, actually it was in Australia and, you know, we had a series of architects and the architects were talking about something and, and, and we said, well, why don't you think about ventilating the building in this manner? And they were like, you can't do that. And I said, well, why not? You can do that. I mean, I showed them some images from Pittsburgh and they were like, really? I'm like, yeah, of course. And that actually mm-hmm. changed their whole conception of where the core went in the building. And, th- you know, it had a lot of knock on effects. So, you know, I'm not, I wouldn't say, you know, we're at Bureau Happel, we are, again, we're not theoretical. 
Um, there's a difference between, I think, being a theoretical engineer from that perspective and, and, uh, and, and an engineer that pushes boundaries. Mm -hmm. So a, a, a couple of questions are related to, um, well, that one image you showed where you had the iceberg and you showed yeah. staff related costs being a, a huge part of a project. Mm -hmm. um, there's also kind of the, the well-being, the health aspects mm -hmm. of buildings and, and the fact that things might change over time, buildings needing to be adaptable. But could you give kind of some examples of what like the, the staff costs, what, what's been done to kind of change that you know the idea you i guess you want to optimize that like you would other parts I, of the structure. i don't know if it's it's, it's changed um uh, uh you could search it online 330 300 um uh jones lang lasalle literally patented this um which is three dollars this is a, a typical yearly building commercial building cost three dollars a square foot for utility your energy thirty dollars a square foot for your rent shall we say your capital cost and $300 a square foot for your employees. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they patented it. And that's basically where they're, what, I mean, I, I think the, the idea here is that, I mean, it's not, I'm not the only person in the world that realizes this. Um, a lot of people realize this now, but it's it just, it, what I'm, it dawned on me at, 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 at some point, it dawned on us at, at Bureau Happel that we were kind of optimizing to a certain extent around some of the wrong problems at times. You know, not putting, you know, reducing your energy in buildings, as I've also shown, is important, you know, to get to the net zero carbon element, but really thinking about how you actually improve well-being and how you improve on the, on the, the, um, on the, 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 the personal, you know, the, the employee side is important. I, for instance, giving everybody access to daylight. I mean, making a, con how many how many buildings have you been in where there's a conference room that doesn't have daylight in it? I mean, that's a crime. That's a crime, you know, seriously. You know, having access to the outside, being able to walk outside, you know, um, being able to, you know, I, you know, all of these things actually make buildings healthier experiences for all of us. So, and they, they contribute to that you know, really that, that optimizing that $300 a square foot. Mm -hmm. Okay. Listen, Craig, I see we're, we're coming up against time. If it was a radio show, they'd start to bring in the music now. <laughs> okay. But we still have, unfortunately, questions we couldn't get to, but we do need to wrap up. But, but, but again, I would really like to, to thank you for this just incredible talk, super timely, and, and, and just showing real projects where you, you, put these ideas to use and you, you develop them further and further. I think it's really super inspirational. And, um, and the last thing we'll, we'll definitely get you out to campus when, uh, when, we're, back, when we're back on campus sometime. Cause we can't really wait. Like it's going to take me a while to think of my next five futures. So, uh, but so, so give me a little bit of time. All right. Well, you could, <laughs> the five you showed us have quite a life. I think they could be re repeated or built upon, but, but again, I'd really like to thank you. I'd also like to thank everybody in the audience who's been with us today. I think, uh, I forget, at the peak, we, we were up 160 or so people joining the call. Um, really appreciate everybody's attention. I appreciate all those questions too, and sorry that we couldn't get to all of them. Well, again, thank you. Really tremendous, tremendous lecture, presentation, answer to, and discussion. So uh, have a good day, everybody. I look forward to seeing yeah. you in person Yeah, sooner, sooner rather than later. Okay, yeah. okay. Take, care, take care, everybody. Thanks so much, right, Craig. Cheers, bye. Bye now.